What I'd like to do is read excerpts from three of my books, uh, and then if people are interested, I'm happy to spend some time just chatting with you, answering questions about my, uh, my writing life, publishing life, reading life, um, whatever you're curious about. Um, so, um, The Brief History of the Dead uh, is a novel that Josh mentioned. It came out in 2006. Yes, 2006. <laughs> um, and this is a novel that has two strands. Um, one of those strands follows a woman named Laura Bird, who is a researcher and has been isolated in the Antarctic, uh, where she gradually discovers that a calamity has befallen the rest of the human race. The other strand takes place in the afterlife, um, specifically in a city of the dead but not yet forgotten. So the idea is that once you pass away, you move on to this other place, and you remain there so long as you're remembered by somebody who's still alive. Once you've been forgotten by the living, then you move on to whatever might come next. Um, and I'd like to read just the opening couple pages of this book to you. And uh, these pages take place in that city of the dead but not yet forgotten. Uh, and the chapter is called the city. When the blind man arrived in the city, he claimed that he had traveled across a desert of living sand. First he had died, he said, and then, snap, the desert. He told the story to everyone who would listen, bobbing his head to follow the sound of their footsteps. Showers of red grit fell from his beard. He said that the desert was bare and lonesome and that it had hissed at him like a snake. He had walked for days and days until the dunes broke apart beneath his feet, surging up around him to lash at his face. Then everything went still and began to beat like a heart. The sound was as clear as any he had ever heard. It was only at that moment, he said, with a million arrow points of sand striking his skin, that he truly realized he was dead. Jim Singer, who managed the sandwich shop in the Monument District, said that he had felt a prickling sensation in his fingers and then stopped breathing. It was my heart, he insisted, thumping firmly on his chest. Took me in my own bed. He had closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, he was on a train, the kind that trolleys small children around in circles at amusement parks. The rails were leading him through a thick forest of gold-brown trees, but the trees were actually giraffes, and their long necks were reaching like branches into the sky. A wind rose up and peeled the spots from their backs. The spots floated down around him, swirling and dipping in the wake of the train. It took him a long time to understand that the throbbing noise he heard was not the rattling of the wheels along the tracks. The girl who liked to stand beneath the poplar tree in the park said that she had died into an ocean the color of dried cherries. For a while, the water had carried her weight, she said, and she had lain on her back, turning in meaningless circles, singing the choruses of the pop song she remembered. But then there was a drum of thunder, and the clouds split open, and the ball bearings began to pelt down around her, tens of thousands of them. She had swallowed as many as she could, she said, stroking the cracked trunk of the poplar tree. She didn't know why. She filled like a canvas sack and sank slowly through the layers of the ocean. Shoals of fish brushed past her, their blue and yellow scales the single brightest thing in the water. And all around her she heard that sound, the one that everybody heard the regular pulsing of a giant heart. 
The stories people told about the crossing were as varied and elaborate as their 10 billion lives. So much more particular than those other stories, the ones they told about their deaths. After all, there were only so many ways a person could die. Either your heart took you, or your head took you. Or it was one of the new diseases. But no one followed the same path over the crossing. Lev Paley said that he had watched his atoms break apart like marbles, roll across the universe, then gather themselves together again out of nothing at all. Han Bing Li said that he woke inside the body of an aphid and lived an entire life in the flesh of a single peach. Graciela Cavazos would say only that she began to snow, four words, and smile bashfully whenever anyone pressed her for details. No two reports were ever the same, and yet always there was the drum-like thumping noise. Some people insisted that it never went away, that if you concentrated and did not turn your ear from the sound, you could hear it faintly behind everything in the city. The brakes and the horns, the bells on the doors of restaurants, the clicking and slapping of different kinds of shoes on the pavement. Groups of people came together in parks or on rooftops just to listen for it, sitting quietly with their backs turned to one another. Badum, badum, badum. It was like trying to keep a bird in sight as it lifted, blurred, and faded to a dot in the sky. So that's a couple pages from the brief history of the dead. Um, next, I'd like to read a couple pages from uh, my most recent book, um, Save One. I, I have a book coming out in April of next year. Um, but my most recent to date is uh, a novel called The Illumination. And uh, The Illumination is a book about what happens to the world when people who are in pain begin to generate light so that you can see when the people around you are suffering. Um, specifically, it follows the fortunes of six characters. There's a data analyst, a photojournalist, a school child, a missionary, a writer, and a street vendor. And all of these characters are enduring injuries of one kind or another, um, many of them physical injuries, but some of them psychological or spiritual injuries. And they all feel that this phenomenon changes their way of uh, thinking about their own place in the world and uh, the places of all the people that surround them. And um, the pages I'd like to read to you are from the photojournalist's chapter. His name is Jason Williford. And uh, in these pages, you'll witness this phenomenon of the illumination um, as it begins to play out inside his body. In the accident, he had cracked his sternum and three of his ribs, dislocated his right shoulder, fractured his pelvis, and knocked identical wedge-shaped fragments out of his front teeth. The steering column had crushed his right knee. A ballpoint pen, flung loose from the coin tray, had perforated his stomach. The side curtain airbag had bruised his left eye. And at first, after the swelling went down, he presumed that the light he saw leaking from his injuries was a result of the contact lens the doctor had prescribed, designed to keep the scab beneath his eyelid from scratching his cornea. Then someone told him about the illumination, and he understood that the same thing was happening all over the world. Everywhere, everywhere, in bars, locker rooms, parks, and emergency wards, the wounded were burning with light. He could see his own lesions shining through the bandages on his shoulder, the cotton compress on his abdomen, the pins and netting of his leg harness. He was aware of the pain, 
But ever since he woke from surgery, his senses had been buoyed up on a sea of narcotics. And as he lay there staring at the contours of his limbs, it seemed to him that he was watching a distant cloud bank flashing with lightning. Somewhere far away, the rain was falling straight and hard. The sand was pockmarked with raindrops. It was all so lovely and mysterious. And yet for the nurses, who came every few hours to change his dressing and adjust his drainage tubes, he had only one question. Can I see my wife? Will you check on her for me? Her name is Patricia, Patricia Williford, Patty. I'll have someone look into that for you, sir. She'll be worried about me. I need to let her know that I'm all right. For now, let's just concentrate on taking care of that body of yours, okay? It was like that every time he asked about her, as if his questions had slid through some invisible crack in the air and vanished into another world. Had they spoken to his wife yet? I'm sure the doctor will be in to talk to you soon. What was her condition? Are you feeling any discomfort, Mr. Williford? How are those painkillers working for you? Evidently, a decision had been made that he was too fragile to know the truth. By the time his doctor finally sat down to explain what had happened to her, he was only waiting for someone to say the words out loud. I'm sorry, Mr. Williford. We did everything we could, but your wife's injuries were too extensive. She didn't make it. His 23 days in the hospital were spent watching his bones heal and his scars form, trying to forget who he was and what had happened to him. He couldn't cough or even breathe too deeply without feeling that his ribs were about to split open. Hiccups were a terror. The one time he sneezed, his vision blurred and he nearly passed out. Whenever he shifted his weight, he saw two long serrations of light opening through the thin blue cotton of his exam gown, one across his sternum, another over his left hip. The ballpoint pen had left a small round mark on the white field of his stomach, and he discovered that the seat belt had printed his torso with a crisply bordered bruise like a soldier's bandolier, its ammunition sash glinting in the sunlight. Day by day, he watched as it turned blue, then green, then spread over his skin in a grotesque yellow stain that gradually lost its shine and color. The radiance that had filtered from his mouth ceased to show as soon as his incisors were capped with porcelain. Suddenly, to his relief, he could pronounce his F's and his V's again. It was his kneecap that took the longest time to mend. For nearly two weeks, it sent an excruciating silver spike through his leg every time he moved in his harness. Just when it seemed the pain was beginning to abate, his physical therapist decided that the day had come for him to try walking again. She lowered his leg onto the bed and measured him for crutches. They might be somewhat uncomfortable for you at first, she cautioned, but won't it feel good to leave here on your own two feet? Now hold your horses until I come back, she said. And he lay there thinking about what it would be like to open his front door to collect the mail and attempt to revive the plants. The name he had been struggling to ignore rose up inside him and pressed at his lips. Her name is Patricia, Patricia Williford, Patty. Only his long habit of silence and the abrasions lingering in his mouth 
kept him from repeating it out loud. Soon the physical therapist returned with a pair of metal crutches. Chromium, she said, with gel polymer tips, the best we have. She insisted that he test them out. As he wobbled across the room, she carefully laid out her instructions, presenting them one by one, like a waiter placing dishes on a table. Nice and easy, that's right. Balance yourself on your left leg, your left leg. If it hurts, that means you're not letting the crutches do the work. You want to avoid placing any weight on that injured knee of yours. He found that if he ignored her advice, if instead he leaned into the pain when it came, his leg would flood with a glow so strong he was unaware of anything else. For a few seconds, he seemed to be nothing more than the light of that shattered bone, white and expansive, pulsing within its own radiance, and his wife's name faded entirely from his mind. The agony was nearly indistinguishable from bliss. So that's a couple pages from his section of um, the illumination. Finally, I'd like to read a piece from um, a fairly recent story collection called The View from the Seventh Layer. Um, this one came out in 2008, and uh, it's a collection of 13 stories um, of disparate modes pursuing very different aims, uh, but four of them are short fantasies that I hope have kind of an air of classical fairy tales about them. Um, and uh, fables is, uh, is how I think of them, even though they're not animal stories necessarily. Um, but they're all these very short, fantastic stories um, with these unwieldy titles. Um, so there's one called A Fable Ending in the Sound of a Thousand Parakeets, um, A Fable with a Photograph of a Glass Mobile on the Wall, A Fable Containing a Reflection the Size of a Match Head in Its Pupil, and then finally, the one I'd like to read is called A Fable with Slips of White Paper Spilling from the Pockets. Once, there was a man who happened to buy God's overcoat. He was rummaging through a thrift store when he found it hanging on a rack by the fire exit nestled between a birch-colored fisherman's sweater and a cotton blazer with a suede patch on one of the elbows. Though the sleeves were a bit too long for him and one of the buttons was cracked, the coat fit him well across the chest and shoulders, lending him a regal look that brought a pleased yet diffident smile to his face. So the man took it to the register and paid for it. He was walking home when he discovered a slip of paper in one of the pockets. An old receipt, he thought, or maybe a to-do list forgotten by the coat's previous owner. But when he took it out, he found a curious note typed across the front. Please help me figure out what to do about Albert. The man wondered who had written the note and whether, in fact, that person had figured out what to do about Albert. But not, it must be said, for very long. After he got home, he folded the slip of paper into quarters and dropped it in the ceramic dish where he kept his breath mints and his car keys. It might never have crossed his mind again had his fingers not fallen upon two more slips of paper while he was riding the elevator up to his office the next morning. One read, don't let my nerves get the better of me this afternoon. And the other, I'm asking you with all humility to keep that boy away from my daughter. The man shut himself in his office and went through the coat pocket by pocket. It had five compartments altogether two front flap pockets, 
each of which lay over an angled hand warmer pocket, with the fleece almost completely worn away, as well as a small inside pocket above the left breast. He rooted through them one by one until he was sure they were completely empty, uncovering seven more slips of paper. The messages typed across the front all seemed to be wishes or requests of one sort or another. Please let my mom know I love her. I'll never touch another cigarette as long as I live if you'll just make the lump go away. Give me back the joy I used to know. There was a tone of quiet intimacy to the notes, a starkness, an open-hearted pleading that seemed familiar to the man from somewhere. Prayers, he realized. That's what they were, prayers. But where on earth did they come from? He was lining them up along the edge of his desk when Isley, from technical support, rapped on the door to remind him about the 10 o'clock meeting. Half an hour of coffee and spreadsheet displays, he said, should be relatively painless. And he winked, firing an imaginary pistol at his head. As soon as Isley left, the man felt the prickle of an obscure instinct and checked the pockets of his coat again. He found a slip of paper reading, the only thing I'm asking is that you give my Cindy another few years. Cindy was Isley's cat, familiar to everyone in the office from his Christmas cards and his online photo diary. A simple coincidence? Somehow he didn't think so. For the rest of the day, the man kept the coat close at hand, draping it over his arm when he was inside and wearing it buttoned to the collar when he was out. By the time he locked his office for the night, he believed he had come to understand how it worked. The coat was, or seemed to be, a repository for prayers. Not unerringly, but often enough, when the man passed somebody on the street or stepped into a crowded room, he would tuck his hands into the coat's pockets and feel the thin, flexed form of a slip of paper brushing his fingers. He took a meeting with one of the interns from the marketing division and afterward discovered a note that read, please, oh please, keep me from embarrassing myself. He grazed the arm of a man who was muttering obscenities his feet planted flat on the sidewalk, and a few seconds later found a note that read, Why do you do it? Why can't you stop torturing me? That afternoon, on his way out, he was standing by the bank of elevators next to the waiting room when he came upon yet another prayer. All I want, just this once, is for somebody to tell me how pretty I look today. He glanced around. The only person he could see was Jenna, the receptionist, who was sitting behind the front desk with her purse in her lap and her fingers covering her lips. He stepped up to her and said, by the way, that new girl from supplies was right. Right about what? I heard her talking about you in the break room. She was saying how pretty you look today. She was right. That's a beautiful dress you're wearing. The brightness in her face was like the reflection of the sun in a pool of water. You could toss a stone in and watch it fracture into a thousand pieces, throwing off sparks as it gathered itself back together. So that was one prayer, and the man could answer it. But what was he to do with all the others? In the weeks that followed, he found thousands upon thousands more. Prayers for comfort and prayers for wealth. Prayers for love and prayers for good fortune. 
It seemed that at any one time, half the people in the city were likely to be praying. Some of them were praying for things he could understand, even if he could not provide them. Like the waitress who wanted some graceful way to back out of her wedding. Or the UPS driver who asked for a single night of unbroken sleep. While some were praying for things he could not even understand. Let the voice choose lunch this time. Either Amy Susson or Amy Goodale. Nothing less than 30%. He walked past a ring of elementary school students playing Duck Duck Goose and collected a dozen notes reading, Pick Me, Pick Me, along with one that read, I wish you would kill Matthew Brantman. <laughs> he went to a one man show at the repertory theater, sitting directly next to the stage, and afterward, found a handful of notes that contained nothing but the lines the actor had spoken. He made the mistake of wearing the coat to a baseball game and had to leave at the top of the second inning when slips of white paper began spilling from his pockets like confetti. Soon the man realized that he was able to detect the pressure of an incoming prayer before it even arrived. The space around him would take on a certain elasticity as though thousands of tiny sinews were being summoned up out of the emptiness and drawn tight. And he would know, suddenly and without question, that someone was offering his yearning up to the air. It was like the invisible resistance he remembered feeling when he tried to bring the common poles of two magnets together. The sensation was unmistakable. And it seemed that the stronger the force of the prayer, the greater the distance it was able to travel. There were prayers that he received only when he skimmed directly up against another person. But there were others that had the power to find him even when he was walking alone through the empty soccer field in the middle of the park, his footsteps setting little riffles of birds into motion. He wondered whether the prayers were something he had always subconsciously felt, he and everyone else in the world, stirring around between their bodies like invisible eddies, but which none of them had ever had the acuity to recognize for what they were, or whether he was able to perceive them only because he had happened to find the overcoat in the thrift store. He just didn't know. At first, when the man had realized what the coat could do, he had indulged in the kind of fantasies that used to fill his daydreams as a child. He would turn himself into the benevolent stranger, answering people's wishes without ever revealing himself to them. Or he would use the pockets to read people's fortunes somehow. He hadn't yet figured out the details. Or he would be the mysterious, slightly menacing figure who would take people by the shoulder, lock gazes with them, and say, I can tell what you've been thinking. But it was not long before he gave up on those ideas. There were so many prayers. There was so much longing in the world. And in the face of it all, he began to feel helpless. One night, the man had a dream that he was walking by a hotel swimming pool, beneath a sky the same lambent blue as the water, when he recognized God spread out like a convalescent in one of the hotel's deck chairs. You, the man said, what are you doing here? I have your coat. Don't you want it back? God set his magazine down on his lap, folding one of the corners over, and shook his head. It's yours now. They're all yours now. I don't want the responsibility anymore. But don't you understand, the man said to him. We need you down here. How could you just abandon us? And God answered, I came to understand the limitations of my character. 
It was shortly after two in the morning when the man woke up. In the moonlight, he could see the laundry hamper, the clay bowl, and the dozens of cardboard boxes that covered the floor of his bedroom. All of them filled with slips of white paper he could not bear to throw away. The next day, he decided to place an ad in the classified pages. Purchased at thrift store, one overcoat, sable brown with chestnut buttons, pockets worn, possibly of sentimental value. Wish to return to original owner. He allowed the ad to run for a full two weeks, going so far as to pin copies of it to the bulletin boards of several nearby churches. But he did not receive an answer. Nor, it must be said, had he honestly expected to. The coat belonged to him now. It had changed him into someone he had never expected to be. He found it hard to imagine turning back to the life he used to know, a life in which he saw people everywhere he went, in which he looked into their faces and even spoke to them, but was only able to guess at what lay in their souls. One Saturday, he took a train to the city's pedestrian mall. It was a mild day, the first gleam of spring after a long and frigid winter. And though he did not really need the coat, he had grown so used to wearing it that he put it on without a second thought. The pedestrian mall was not far from the airport, and as he arrived, he watched a low plane passing overhead, dipping through the lee waves above the river. A handful of notes appeared in his pockets. Please don't let us fall. Please keep us from going down. Let this be the one that makes the pain go away. The shops, restaurants, and street cafes along the pavement were quiet at first. But as the afternoon took hold, more and more people arrived. The man was walking down a set of steps toward the center of the square when he discovered a prayer that read, let someone speak to me this time, anyone, anyone at all, or else. The prayer was a powerful one, is taut as a steel cord in the air. It appeared to be coming from the woman sitting on the edge of the dry fountain her feet raking two straight lines in the leaves. The man sat down beside her and asked, or else what? She did not seem surprised to hear him raise the question. Or else, she said quietly. He could tell by the soreness in her voice that she was about to cry. Or else, he took her by the hand. Come on, why don't I buy you some coffee? He led her to the coffee house, hanging his coat over the back of a chair and listening to her talk. And before long, he had little question what the or else was. She seemed so disconsolate, so terribly isolated. He insisted she spend the rest of the afternoon with him, he took her to see the wooden boxes that were on display at a small art gallery, and then the Victorian lamps in the front room of an antique store. A movie was playing at the Bargain Theater, a comedy, and he bought a pair of tickets for it, and after it was finished, the two of them settled down to dinner at a Chinese restaurant. Finally, they picked up a bag of freshly roasted pecans from a pushcart down by the river. By then the sun was falling and the woman seemed in better spirits. He made her promise to call him the next time she needed someone to talk to. I will, she said, tucking her chin into the collar of her shirt like a little girl. 
Though he wanted to believe her, he wondered as he rode the train home if he would ever hear from her again. It was the next morning before he realized his overcoat was missing. He went to the lost and found counter at the train station and when he was told that no one had turned it in, traveled back to the pedestrian mall to retrace his steps. He remembered draping the coat over his chair at the coffee house, but none of the baristas there had seen it. Nor had the manager of the movie theater, nor had the owner of the art gallery. The man searched for it in every shop along the square, but without success. That evening, as he unlocked the door of his house, he knew that the coat had fallen out of his hands for good. It was already plain to him how much he was going to miss it. It had brought him little ease, that was true, but it had made his life incomparably richer, and he was not sure what he was going to do without it. We are none of us so delicate as we think, though. And over the next few days, as a dozen new accounts came across his desk at work, the sharpness of his loss faded. He no longer experienced the compulsion to hunt through his pockets all the time. He stopped feeling as though he had made some terrible mistake. Eventually, he was left with only a small ache in the back of his mind, no larger than a pebble, and a lingering sensitivity to the currents of hope and longing that flowed through the air. And at Peng Lin's Chinese restaurant, a new sign soon appeared in the window. Custom fortune cookies, made nightly and on the premises. The diners at the restaurant found the fortune cookies brittle and tasteless. But the messages inside were unlike any they had ever seen. And before long, they developed a reputation for their peculiarity and their singular wisdom. Crack open one of the cookies at Peng Lin's, it was said, and you never knew what fortune you might find inside. Please let the test be canceled. Thy will be done, but I could really use a woman right about now. Why would you do something like this to me? Why? Oh, make me happy. That's that. Thank you very much. Um, so again, I'm happy to spend some time talking with you, answering any questions if you have any about these books or my others or my writing life, my publishing life, my reading life, um, my biography, uh, anything you might be interested in. Um, I will request, however, that uh, you speak very, very loudly. Um, I feel as if I'm you know, at the bottom of a pool listening to things. Um, so are there any questions? Um, so the question is, uh, can I talk about the feeling of wounded loneliness and dislocation in my writing and where I think it comes from? I'm repeating it in case people at the back didn't hear it. Um, you know, uh, last week I attended a, a reading by a husband and wife writing team, Tom Franklin and Beth Ann Fennelly, both of them wonderful writers who together have written a novel um, called The Tilted World. And uh, when they were talking about this book, Tom Franklin mentioned... Um, that writers will be familiar uh, I, with uh, kind of, you know, what it's like to have, uh, it, it, how the writing life can be a sad and lonely one um, because it's very isolating. You know, you're not, it's not a social activity, writing. Um, you know, as much as you feel you're in Congress with other human beings, you're doing it all alone. Um, I, I think of this because I happen to be in the audience for this and I know the two of them and so he said, you know, Kevin Brockmeyer will, you know, 
I'm sure be able to attest to uh, you know the sadness and loneliness of the writing life. So when I had the two of them sign my books, I, I you know I, I insisted that they sign it. Uh, you know, uh, an acknowledgement of my sad loneliness. <laughs> so it's, a, you know, I think all writers should, you know, make a point of speaking about the sadness and loneliness of me at their, <laughs> their events. But um, it, so I, 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 I'm not so sure that it's part of. It, I, I think that experience is certainly part of the common human experience. I don't know that it's the central feature of the common human experience. But I think, in my case. It's something that rises up in me when I'm sitting down to write. I don't always experience it otherwise. And I've been struggling to understand lately whether my life is difficult to me, in, whether my writing expresses the difficulties of my life, or whether my life manifests the difficulties of my writing. I can't figure it out. Um, so what I'm trying to do for a book that I've just started is to write happy. Um, <laughs> and you know, see if it turns my life around. Maybe things will be great now, who knows. Um, so it, it seems to me that for a long time I've been writing the book of Revelation over and over again. And I'm trying to write the book of Genesis now. You know, beginnings rather than endings. And uh, joy rather than sorrow. Um, it is very much the case that the illumination in particular is a book that's entirely oriented around human suffering. And the idea behind that book is it just equates suffering with light, um, a very direct equation. And uh, you could take that idea of the way suffering is bound together with beauty um, and pain is bound together with luminescence. Um, and spin this equation around on itself for, you know, 270 pages. And you would get a book that looks an awful lot like this book does. Um, but it's a, a book that's designed to grapple with exactly those questions. Um, you know, how do we make sense of our lives in the context of the suffering that life exposes us to? Um, and it's a question that I've spent some time thinking about. And it was a question that fed directly into this particular book. Um, yeah, so that's that. Who else? Yes. Um, for me, the, the, the art forms that are at the center of my life are uh, literature, uh, film and music. Um, you know, the others, like uh, visual art, I have some appreciation for, but I feel that it's very much uh, kind of a, 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 a position that's rooted in my own ignorance, basically. Um, whereas I've spent a lot of time reading and also a lot of time movie going and listening to music. Um, now, my talents don't, uh, don't lie in kind of filmmaking, and they certainly don't lie in music making. Um, but just as a human being, I'm very appreciative of those art forms. And uh, it was mentioned in my introduction that, you know, I keep these lists, and that is in fact the case. And, uh, you know, I'm in the habit of uh, kind of keeping this list of my 50 favorite books and uh, kind of handing them out everywhere. But I also keep a list of my 50 favorite albums and my 50 favorite movies and, uh, and kind of various other lists of this type. And I'm, I'm kind of reconsidering them regularly in the light of new experiences. Um, so those are the art forms that are most important to me. Okay, so what was the last book to get kicked off my list of 50 favorite books? <laughs> it's always hard to remember. Um, you know, there are books that you can just kind of tell are hanging on by their fingernails. And I love them, but I know I'm going to read something that's going to demand a space on this list. And I'm sorry, George Orwell, you're going to have to go. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of how it works. So, and it might in fact have been, I, I love... Orwell's nonfiction, his essays, I think, are his greatest work. And uh, that, his collection, a collection of essays, that's the title of a book, a collection of essays, was on this list for a long, long time. And it might have been the last one to get bumped. Um, 
and that would have been this summer, um, June 29th. I always date these lists. Um, so the idea is that it's 50 books, uh, alphabetically by the author's last name, with no more than one book per author, and with asterisks beside my current top 10. Um, so presuming that Orwell was the last one to be bumped, if I'm right about that, he was bumped in favor of a novel I read this summer by Russell Hoban um, called Turtle Diary. It was just republished in a New York Review of Books uh, edition, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, about, uh, like there's, there's very little to the plot, um, but it's about uh, a middle-aged man and a middle-aged woman um, who conspire to free the sea turtles from the London Zoo and release them into the ocean. Um, and that's really all there is to the story. Um, but m more than that, it's just about, uh, uh, it, it, it was one of these books where when I read it, I kept recognizing features of my own experience that I thought were entirely my own. Um, and here they were, like part of Russell Hoban's experience and the experiences of his characters. And it just made me feel reading this book, you know, I'll be damned, I'm a human being, you know? <laughs> it's not just me, like I'm, I'm, I'm part of the world. Um, really an amazing book, and amazing for exactly that feature, the way it makes you feel like you're a part of human concourse, um, one with everybody else. Uh, so I know that that was the book, the last book that elbowed its way onto the list. By the way, I do have a big stack of these, so if anybody is curious to know what my 50 favorite books in alphabetical order by the author's last name, with no more than one book per author, with asterisks beside the current top 10 are, <laughs> then you're welcome to grab one from me at the end of the reading. Who else? Yes. More of an observation than a question. I think you're doing okay because you turned the question of what got kicked off into the question of what came on. What came on, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Um, it, it's, so yeah, maybe maybe I am turning things around. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good sign. Thank you. <laughs> Who else? All right. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, there are books for sale at the table, and I'm going to sit right here. I'll be happy to sign books or uh, talk one on one with anybody. And again, if you'd like to grab a copy of this list, I've got a big stack of them, and you're more than welcome to. Thanks.